Hi, welcome to the channel. And to kick things off, I'd like to start with a review of The Twelve Dreams of Dr. Sardonicus by the band Spirit, released by Epic Records in November 1970. Now first off, I'll nail my colours to the mast and say that if any album deserves a title of classic rock record, this is it. As perfect an album as you'll find from top to bottom. Great songs, great production, great playing. Sardonicus is Spirit's fourth album. And while they had some early success, 67, 68, 69, by the time 1970 rolled around, their management and their record company had seemingly lost interest in the band. Now why was this? It remains a mystery. Live they were brilliant. Great stage presence and like I say great musicians. You only have to listen to some of the bootlegs made back then to see musically they could play any style or genre, jazz, blues, rock, country, funk, anything. And they had a great following. Not only in the States but in Europe, especially in the UK and Germany. So why their record company had virtually abandoned them, no idea. Spirit were also hugely respected by their fellow musicians. Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, the Allman Brothers, Grateful Dead, Alice Cooper were huge fans. In fact, in his radio show a few years back, Alice Cooper said that when he'd seen them in about 67, 68, they were the most talented bunch of musicians he'd ever met. Even Led Zeppelin, who by now were ruling the rock world in terms of sales and concert appearances, were including a spirit song, Fresh Garbage, in their repertoire. So who were spirit? Well, on lead vocals, you had Jay Ferguson. Now, after the demise of Spirit, Jay went on to have a huge, huge hit, worldwide hit with Run, 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 with the band Jojo Gunn. And then after Jojo Gunn, in the late 70s, he had a hugely successful solo career. On keyboards, you had John Locke. Now, John had studied music at college, and when he left college and just before Spirit, he'd been involved in the jazz scene in LA. So he brought all those jazz influences into the band. On lead guitar and sharing the vocal duties, the late, great Randy California. Now, California at 15 had played for six months in New York with Jimi Hendrix as part of Jimi Hendrix and the Blue Flames. Hendrix loved the guitarist so much that when he landed his record contract in England with Chaz Chandler and Track Records, he wanted the young Randy California to come with him and be part of the Jimi Hendrix experience. But Randy's parents felt at 15 he was a bit young to come and live <laughs> the rock and roll lifestyle with Hendrix and made him stay in the States and continue his education. Now Randy first picked up the guitar at the tender age of six years old. His uncle Ed Pearl owned the famous music venue in California, the Ash Grove, which was host to hundreds of great bands and musicians over the years. Now often to save money, these musicians and bands would stay at Randy's family home. And I remember him telling me that he often used to beg to jam with these guys and blag guitar lessons. So an incredible musical education, growing up around these musicians, jamming with them and watching them perform day in, day out. Now for me, Randy California is one of the great unsung American rock heroes. An amazing guitarist, great songwriter. It's a criminal shame that he isn't more widely known and respected. But I do believe at the particular moment there are talks to make a major movie of the life and times of Randy California. And I think if they get it right, it will be a fascinating film. On bass, we have Mark Andes. Now Mark, before he joined Sp in 1967, at the tender age of 16, was on the road with Canned Heat. And when Spirit split up in early 1971, Mark went on to record and tour with dozens and dozens of other artists. Dan Fogelberg, Firefall, Heart. Now what I love about Mark's bass playing is he's not flashy, he's not over, he doesn't overcomplicate things, he just does what's needed to be done. And last but not least, on drums, Mr Skin himself, Ed Cassidy. Now, Ed had been a jobbing jazz drummer for most of his life. He played with jazz legends like Jerry Mulligan, Cannibal Adley, but by the mid-60s and in his 40s. In his own words, he was bored to tears with the jazz scene. So when he was invited to be part of this great new music scene by this talented young bunch of musicians, he didn't need to be asked twice. 
So you had all this great mix of different styles, different influences, all coming together in the melting pot, and in the end producing something absolutely great. Spirit also managed to pull into this project Neil Young's producer, David Briggs, who fitted them in and around the recording of Young's After the Gold Rush album. So let's get on to the album. Now the Sardonicus reference is to Mr Sardonicus, a rather camp horror film from 1961. Now the plot is where the main character, after committing a dastardly deed in the graveyard, has his face frozen into an horrific grin for all time. Now when I saw this film as a kid, it scared the living crap out of me. But viewing it years later, I found it a bit camp, a bit over the top, and quite funny in places. And this is pretty much how the band felt about the film in the late 60s, early 70s. It's a bit of a joke. It became a bit of an in-joke with the band. So the loose concept became the 12 dreams of Dr. Sardonicus. Now, each of the songs does have a otherworldly, dreamlike quality to it, especially in the lyric writing. And it all works. It all comes together and it works. Now, the album kicks off with a prettily acoustic prelude. Jay Ferguson on vocals. He sings, you have the world at your fingertips. No one can make it better than you. But as Randy California joins in on vocals, we are implored to wake up and straight into the pounding funk rock rhythms of Nothing to Hide. Multiple vocals, you from different spots in the soundscape, melting into beautiful harmonies. Mark Andy's bass way up in the mix, California on slide, and Ed Cassidy's intense drumming. Now, the lyrics California has said mirror the start of the breakup of the band. And we've got nothing to hide. We're married to the same bride. She eats away from inside. The song ends with the horns, drums, bass laying down a staccato beat as California piles in with an avalanche of slide guitars and lap steel. Things slow down for the second track, Nature's Way. Almost an acoustic solo piece for Randy California. This is just a beautiful song and it's been covered by dozens of artists over the years. I think way back when I first heard this song, I didn't realise what an amazing composition it truly is. It was only with repeated listenings I started to really grasp the, how good a song this is. It has harmonies and arrangements that George Martin and the Beatles would be proud of. The lyrics concern themselves with how if you mess with nature, if you interfere with nature, she will come back and bite you on the ass. Something we see more and more as the years go by. Randy California loved playing this song. And for many, many years, it was included as part of their live set. In the late 70s, California was to add to this song by adding in the middle a beautiful melodic George Harrison type guitar solo. Now, as Nature's Way draws to a close, a bout of exhaust fumes and coughing, and we continue the ecological theme as the band move into the very kinks-like Animal Zoo. Here, the band seemed to be having a lot of fun. Choppy guitar riff, lots of vocal interplay and a sing-along chorus. But again, the message is clear. If you mess with Mother Nature, she's going to come back and she's going to bite you in the backside. Glockenspiel and Synthesizer dominate the next song, Love Has Found A Way, with its message of celebrating love in a world filled with violence and hatred. But what I particularly love about this song is the superb vocal harmonies between Ferguson, Andes and California which take the song to a new level. These harmonies are as good as you will ever hear. Love Has Found A Way doesn't so much come to an end, but is interrupted by the next track, what is virtually a solo acoustic piece from Randy California, Why Can't I Be Free? Now, again, this is a longing for spiritual freedom and very much in keeping with the times of when the album was released. As the song comes to a conclusion, a deep sigh panning from speaker to speaker, takes us into the great Mr. Skin. Now in another life, this should have been a huge, huge hit. It's as funky as hell. A great punchy horn section, killer sax solo, and the band playing like there's no tomorrow. It sounds like it could have been a late era Motown classic. Sadly, when the song was released as a single in, I think, 1973, only reached, I think, number 63, which again, to me, will always remain a mystery. Now, the one gripe I have about this song, and don't get me wrong, on the album, it's absolutely magnificent. 
the band playing like there's no tomorrow, playing out of their skin, is that when the band played it live, I always felt California could have imitated the sax solo and live it would have made it even better. But like I said, that's them live on this album. It's absolutely magnificent. Now on the original vinyl release, the choppy organ and guitar riff at the beginning was edited out. But it was replaced on the expanded edition in 1996. And for me, it makes a lovely intro to the song and adds just that little bit extra to this great, great song. Space Child opens up side two of this album. Now this is a moody, atmospheric, jazzy piece from John Locke, with Locke showing off his considerable keyboard skills on piano, organ and synth. And it also shows the band's ability to move seamlessly from the funk of the previous track to the jazz of this. Burst of Maniacal Laughter takes us into the next track, When I Touch You. Now this is probably the darkest song Spirit ever recorded. It's a song that concerns itself with love, anger, rage and jealousy. And set to a brooding guitar riff by Randy California. California speeds up the riff, slows it down and the song twists and turns with Ferguson taking his vocals to the limit before the song exits with another great solo from Randy California. Ferguson's Street Worm is up next and this has been a firm favourite of mine for almost 50 years. I love this song for the moment I heard it. It's a real rocker. Based around Locke's chunky piano chords, Cassidy's tasteful but restrained drumming and those beautiful harmonies come in again. And are on top, top form here. You've got Ferguson singing about not making any deals and riding his motorcycle on the rooftops, but it's California's guitar playing that takes this song again to another level. As this song nears its end, California just opens up on guitar. Now he said in an interview years later that he wanted to make this solo as near to a John Coltrane solo as possible, as near to a John Coltrane sax solo as possible. And like I say, if you have a listen to it, I think you got it. It's just fantastic guitar playing. The beautiful Life Has Just Begun is up next. Now in the 90s, to open a live show, California would often open the show by playing a short acoustic set. This song stripped back down to just Randy and acoustic guitar was magical. But here in its original album setting with the band playing, it's just as magical. It's just a song about the power of love and how it heals, pure and simple. Part of it even sounds like it's sung through a megaphone and somehow crazily it works. So what would be best to come next? What would be the best song to come next on a perfect album? I know, a rocking, rolling, celebratory song with a great horn section and a killer guitar riff. And that's just what we get with Morning Will Come. For 2 minutes 51 seconds the whole band rip it up and again superb playing and arrangements. The album finishes with the elegant and haunting soldier. I've always taken this song to be about a guy saying goodbye to his love as he sets off for war and it's full of beautiful melodies and harmonies. And as the song fades we're brought back to the beginning again and prelude. As the album fades you have the world at your fingertips. No one makes it better than you. So in summing up all my chundering on, this is a great, great record. It's To me, it's a masterpiece and its beauty hasn't faded over the 50 years I've been listening to it. But like I said, the record didn't get the promotion it deserved when it came out in 1970. And in the UK, it was terribly difficult to find. I think it took me about four weeks to find it. But this should have been the album to push the band on and to get them the recognition that they deserved. Sadly though, not long after this album's release, on the eve of a tour of Japan, which I believe would have been great for the band in terms of exposure and record sales, the band split up and went their separate ways. Now initially when this album came out, it didn't get good reviews, it sold poorly, but over the years people have come to recognise it as a classic it is. And it continued to sell well throughout the 70s and eventually it achieved gold record status. Thanks for watching and if there's any albums that you people out there want me to review and have a look at please drop them in the comments section and I'll see you in the next video. And again thanks for watching and supporting the channel. It's much appreciated.